Hi and welcome to the final video of 2022 from Dean Park. Lots to update you on in this video, which includes completed scenic details along the entire length of the Great Wall. I show you how to create effective buddly eye plants, ideal for that lineside location. I also spend a few nights detailing some of my own and some of my friends' models with bogey and buffer beam details. And finally, I look back on 2022, a year that was jam-packed with new additions to the layout. But which will be my best model of the year? Stay tuned to find out. I'm keen to hear all your feedback so please post this in the comments section as well as give this video a thumbs up and click on that subscribe button to support the channel. In the meantime, enjoy the video. I'm now at the stage of adding some line side detail along the wall area and for this I've used some scale model scenery sleepers. I'll put the link to this product in the description below. For that I've used real match sleeper grime and then along the middle I've used some real match roof dirt to give an oily stained appearance. I've then used some Tamiya weathering masters to give it a more bleached worn out effect using earth and light earth tones along with some rust. The rust appearing around about where the, the bolts would go through the chairs and into the sleeper. These are now being grouped together in blocks and will be placed at the line side in a random kind of nature, along with some loose sleepers as well. Now that I've got all the line side detail in place, such as the grass tufts and bushes, shrubbery, and piles of sleepers and that kind of detail, I'm going to go across the ballast and the track area with some real match sleeper grime through an airbrush just to tone everything down, weather it in a little bit more and it just kind of blends it all together. This will have the added effect of having some overspray on the line side scenic material such as the grass tufts and bushes because they would have got a little bit um, dirty with all the, the traffic going past on the tracks. I'll then go over the middle of the tracks with some real match roof dirt just to give the impression of staining and some oil leakings. That will then bring the scene together, complete it, I'll then reassemble the area, put the walls back and that will be the job done. That's me finished with the airbrushing of this section. Hope you can see from the shot there that the ballast has been toned down a little bit using the sleeper grime and the roof dirt in between the tracks. I'll then let this dry and then I'll go over the, the tops of the tracks and I could then run trains again. This is a section on the wall that I'm most pleased with actually. We've got the kind of junk area at the left hand side of the tracks there with your rusty rails both stacked and loose. You've got the piles of sleepers that are kind of sporadic along the length of the wall. You've got the relay boxes which have been given a, a sympathetic weathering I suppose. Um, and that all kind of ties in with the low lying mossy grass gravelly area building up to some tufts of static grass and some buddleii and other bushes. At the right hand side of the rails I've kind of gone for a um, similar theme with the bushes but not overdone the positioning of them just as again sporadic along the bottom of the wall there and as I've taken the airbrush along it's weathered some of these as well because the bushes would get uh, a bit dirty with the, the muck thrown up from the trains as they went past. This all ties in nicely with the you know the catch pits that I've got along there as well and hopefully you can see here I've actually put an extra light above just to light this area up for us while I do the same bit of filming. The additional um, weathering on the track or the ballast and just in front of where the 37's sitting there, hopefully you can see the additional streaking of basically oil deposits. Maybe a local's been sitting there for a while and obviously these uh, these things just leaked um, 
so the track got pretty murky pretty quick so I, I've just kind of brought all that together um, the section at the top of the wall just off the top left of the camera there that'll be getting worked on shortly and it'll be the same kind of thing overgrown waste ground um, and bits and pieces urban urban junk I really am pleased with this um, three aspect signal with a PLS indicator and when the the turnout is turned to go to the left into the the siding and um, what happens there is the the light will go on I'll do that just now and as it goes past the sensor it'll go to red and the the light will go off it's basically a shunt signal on a on a plinth there attached to the the signal post itself it's all about the line side details for me I just love adding these little finishing touches to a scene um, to mix them with the, you know the ballast the weeds the grass I've got the pile of sleepers the rusty rails and these LNER LABR um, speed signs there with the, the root indicator going off to the left um, I've got a mixture of these style of speed signs on the layout as well as the more modern ones during the 1980s it was a more of a transition period you still saw a lot of these actually well into the late 1990s being used on the network so I thought I'd use these along this area as opposed to the more modern ones I've also added the cabling in to go to and from the cable trunking to the, the point motors and um, point heater there at the right hand side again I just like adding these little bits of details it's all been kind of weathered down as well as I've gone past with the airbrush even the, the cable trunking has been toned down and I've got the small cables going there from the, the Orange Conduit which is an, a scale model series product I'll put the link to that in the description below all the cables are just linked as they should be and you'll get a better view of the, the cable trunking across the other side of the rail there as well at the tunnel end I've blended in the bottom of the portal with some bushes these are just finely foliaged from Woodland Scenics and you can see at the bottom of the shot there how these bushes almost um, blend in with the the tufts of static grass in varying shades it's only when you finish a scene you take a step back and you start to count up the the hours the hundreds of hours that have gone into putting it together and then you really appreciate you know how far you've come um, it might not look much it's only uh, maybe a three and a half four meter section of the layout um, but I started the walls last October it took months of painting um, getting the the actual mortar wash in there then the weathering then the attaching of the walls together and building up you know building up the kit it's a scale model scenery's premium kit I'll put the link to that in the description below then I had to devise a way of having them removable in sections so I could access any wiring underneath the, the you know the depot and the main running lines there and that had all to be factored in when I did the the scenic material along the bottom of the wall as well so it all kind of takes time to plan and I'm not one for rushing I don't know if you've noticed I like to do a job right so I don't then have to go back eight months later because I'm not happy with the initial job you know this job hopefully will will um, allow me to move on to another part of the layout and, and really enjoy running trains along the front of the wall which I've, I've really waited for for you know a number of years now so I'm, I'm pleased now that this side of the layout is dare I say almost complete and I can move to the section at the back of the camera where obviously we've got an, a lot of work to do and it's going to be an industrial scene and a lot of landscape work to be done as well if you have any thoughts feedback or comments on this section as i've completed it that might include the depot section as well please do add those in the comment section below i get asked quite often how i make my budley eye bushes that i have along the side of the line and on waste ground um, it's really a simple process I've got both purple flowering which you see in front of you now and I've added some lighter pink flowering ones to sections along the front of the retaining wall it just breaks up the monotonous green colors that you get um, it's very easy to get you know sucked into just doing different varieties of green but if you look at line sides depending on what time of year it is of course you've got those pesky budley eye that seem to spread everywhere um, and I really think it's a, a viable little uh, bit of scenic material to add on the layout so in the next clips I'll show you how easy it is to make bushes just like this the process for making budley eye is dead simple you're just going to use some generic bush in this case I've got some fine leaf foliage from Woodland Scenics this is the olive green and that is the light green now budley eye come in different varieties and colors you've got white pink purple um, 
depending on what time of year it is, the, the colour may vary on the actual flowers if you like. A lot of the Burley Eye up my way are of the pink variety. I'm driving through the country in late summer, which my layout is set in. There's um, you know, seas of pink beside the side of the road and along the railway lines. There is the purple variety as well, and that's why I've got both displayed on the layout. In this case, I'm going to show you how to make some of the kind of lighter pink um, variety, because that's just what I've basically um, covered the, the bits of wire in. Once you've got the foliage or the bush in the shape that you want, I'd recommend sticking that onto the layout um, just to give it a, a solid foundation. I just use you know, white PVA to do that. Once it's in position, you want to get your um, super glue. In this case, I just used some Rocket Rapid. I'll just put a little bit on the paper. Then what I've got is I've got the, the length of 0.45 wire. And what I've done with this wire is I've sprayed it in um, just spray glue, spray mount, and I've sprinkled the, the fine uh, foliage over the wire, given it a little time to dry, sprayed it again, scattered it again, just to build up the thickness. It is very, very thin wire, and if you only put one layer on, it tends to be a bit thin. But again, depending on the variety and you know, the look you're going for. I've gone over that three or four times with um, spray glue, building up the layers, and you know, allow it to set for a good um, 24 hours, because it can still be quite tacky after a little while. Then it's a case of taking your wire cutters, I'm trimming it into about oh, what, 10, 12 millimeter lengths, random, doesn't matter, and as many as you want, obviously, to put on the tree or the bush. Then I use a pair of pliers or pincers, choose the best end to stick outwards, and dip in the glue before placing it into the bush. Letting it go. Don't worry too much about the angle. Remember, uh, you know, not all flowers grow straight up, depending on which way the sun's shining, which angle the sun hits the plant. The plant or the flower are always trying to follow the sun. So I'm just going to put another one there, slightly different angle, doesn't matter, and leave it to dry. Now you can go as heavy or light as you, you fancy on this, depending on how uh, you know flowery you want the bush, or indeed what time of year it is. So there you go, job done. Simple, just get some foliage of your choice. I've used Woodland Scenic's fine leaf foliage. Get some scatters of the colours you want. I've got some purples as well, which um, I showed you at the beginning of this uh, series of clips. And a bit of super glue, cut the wire to length and plonk them on the bush. It's as easy as that. The level of additional detail you can add to these new Backman locos is really quite cool. Um, looking at the Class 47 Greyfriars Bobby, you'll see that it's got the electric train heating jumper uh, sockets there attached to the front of the cab. This doesn't appear on all Class 47s. Later versions, or when they went through the works later in their life, had these moved down to the buffer beam, usually for when they were fitted with snow ploughs, or to have the brackets for snow ploughs fitted. So there's a lot of detail and added extras to go on this um, large logo livery one. Not as much, I have to say, as on the swallow livery, which was really quite intense with all the, the pipe work around the buffer beam. But again, it just lifts the model to that extra uh, level of detail and it really makes it look cool when it's standing still or going around the layout. In the case of the Class 37, it's a much simpler buffer beam on the loco as well as the model, but it's still bristling with added pipes and cabling and I especially like the way that they've um, got the cabling uh, sockets to fit perfectly in the holes of the buffer beam. Uh, previous Backman models, you had to either um, pare down the actual pipe that was to go in the hole, or you had to make the hole bigger, and it could take a bit of uh, extra time to fit all the details, and even then, you know, they weren't exactly perfect fits. With the new range of models, including the, the 24, the 47, the 37, um, and, and the Class 20, in fact, the cables are better designed, the socket holes are just perfectly um, sized to take the, the, the fitting without any filing or um, paring down. So that's a really impressive and a bit of progress really from Backman. 
If you saw my Class 37 review um, earlier in the year, you'll have noticed that I had a bit of an issue or an opinion on the NEM snow ploughs. As you'll notice here, I've not got the snow ploughs fitted to this Class 37 split box because I can't have that as well as the buffer beam detail. You can really enhance the appearance of the Hornby Class 91 by adding the supplied um, buffer beam detail. A bit disappointing that um, the NEM socket is, is visible through uh, from track level anyway through the valance at the front, but from this kind of angle it looks perfectly okay to me. The Backman Class 47 at the back, um, it's been backdated. Um, with it you get the tampoed Tinsley Rose uh, plaque on the side, as well as etched plates in the pack. But what I've done is I've gone to Shopland or Extreme Etchings and got the Eastfield uh, Terrier plaques and I've fitted them on as well as the, the BR arrows at the other end of the, the loco under the cab uh, and the running number. I've fitted these using some um, Humbrol matte coat which is basically a varnish and you put a little bit on the back of the, the etched plate and lower it into position, hold it steadily and then leave the loco on its side for the, the varnish to grab. I got this tip from Chris um, down at Scooney Hobbies so thanks to you Chris for that. I'll certainly be um, having the confidence now to fit some etched plates using this method. It's less instant than super glue um, and if you do get a little bit on the body it's easily removed while wet with a bit of enamel thinners on a cotton bud. I've seen many an example of name plates and, and depot plaques fitted with super glue with oozing out the side and once that's done you're never getting super glue off at least with the matte coat you've got a bit of time to work to clean up anything but again you shouldn't be putting that much on a little dab in the middle and when you press the plaque in place that spreads to the the back of the etching and they uh, say after about an, an hour or so it's uh, it's grabbed enough for you to you know stand the logo up on its wheels again the next task for me is to weather the rail sides of the track that goes into the tunnel and obviously the stuff that comes out of the tunnel as well. What I'm going to do here is I'm just going to do the, the sides of the track just now and fully weather the track that's inside the tunnel. I'll be leaving this just with the tracks done just now because when I add in all the scenic material I'll then go over the, the tops of the ballast and in between the tracks to blend it all in. The reason I'm doing this now is I want to be able to put the, the top section on here and then do some scenic work on that. So once that is fixed in place, it's all weathered, that leaves me free to do this stuff at a later date. I'll not be showing you a how-to on ballasting, I've done that video previously, I'll put the link to that at the top of the screen. And I'll also put a link at the end of the video to my How to Build a Model Railway series of videos. And in that it's got how to ballast, how to track weather, how to ballast a turnout. Um, how to paint brickwork and all the kind of instructional videos that I've done so you might want to check that out if you're building your own model railway at home. When weathering the track it's uh, important for those of you who are relying on a contact between the, the point blade and the outer rails to tape up the contacts. I've just used some Tamiya masking tape here. For me it's also important to cover any sensors that I've got for signal work in the track. In this case I've got my Heathcote um, electronic boards with the infrared sensors. I've just covered those with tiny blobs of black tack. I don't want paint getting on the, the lens of the, the sensor because it will not work and it's very difficult if it does get painted to clean. That's the track work now painted. You'll see the left hand side of the shot. That's the section that will be in the tunnel and I've added some roof dirt and more sleeper grime in between the tracks to give a more grimy appearance. At the right hand side of the shot you'll see the tracks that have just been weathered actually on the rail. I've not gone into the middle of the tracks or the side of the ballast. That will be done later, as I've said earlier, when I do the scenic material at this section of the layout. This year saw me finally add a Class 86 to my collection. This all new Helian model is a big step forward from their previous effort. The pantograph and roof detail on this new model is impressive, as is the underframe and bogey detail. Hellion have also fitted an updated lighting suite too, making it more accurate to the real loco. Some modellers have commented that Hellion haven't quite captured the shape of the cab area, but to me it looks pretty good. One area that disappoints is the inconsistent finish on the yellow cab roof, with some areas receiving a better coverage than others. 
This doesn't detract from the overall ownership experience though, and I'll be getting myself an 86-2 when they're released next year. The announcement of the new APT was met with much excitement and fanfare, being part of the Hornby 2020 centenary range. The addition of the coach packs started to arrive last autumn, but modellers had to wait until the start of this year to get their hands on the actual APT train packs. The model captures the shape of the real thing, and Hornby have done a good job in the level of finish, using accurate paint shades. However, for many this model was a bit of a letdown. First, it requires three decoders, adding at least £60 to an already expensive and some would say well overpriced train pack. Plus, to get the cab lighting to work, you have to use one of Hornby's 8 pin decoders. Secondly, the centrally mounted drivetrain lacks enough grunt to adequately push and pull an extended length of train. Hornby released enough coaches to make up a full 14 m car train, but the power unit just simply doesn't have the capability of moving it. The dummy power car or NDM is too heavy, with the same die cast chassis as the powered one, adding needless weight. There's also the flimsy, poorly designed pantograph, which rarely stays in the upright position. Moving on, the interiors are self coloured and a bit basic, which is shown up by the bright interior lighting. The lighting is controlled directly from the track via pickups that create drag and don't allow the switching of light functions. The lights are connected to a massive capacitor that you can see through the windows, which actually doesn't work as it should with the lights going off when the wheels go over a dirty or dead piece of track. All in all, a nice looking model, but I feel that it's been rushed to market, it's overpriced and it's poorly designed in some areas. Not to mention the flimsy body clips used to assemble it, that more often than not will snap when trying to access the coaches to add detail or fit passengers. It made it into my top 10, but I really had hoped for better to be honest. Hornby assure us that the next release of this model will address a lot of these issues, but that's no good to those of us who've shelled out nearly £1,000 on a full 14 car train. See my full review, the link to this is at the top of the screen. This year saw the Class 91 from Hornby finally arrive. This long overdue and eagerly anticipated new model has been on my wish list since the start of Dean Park. The whole station and upper main line was designed to run these locos. Hornby initially released four liveries and I've purchased them all. The livery shades are excellent, the level of detail is good but it's not without its issues. We've got a plastic pantograph which is okay but when other companies are giving us motorised versions for not much more money it would have been nice to see Hornby make more of an effort. There are some errors in some of the details as well, for example the incorrect cab detailing on the Intercity Swallow 91, plus the locals tend to suffer from a bit of wobble. Again I think Hornby have rushed this to market and not tested it enough, just like their APT. The introduction of more lighting features and a 21 pin decoder are most welcome. Overall I like it and it looks good operating in the layout. You can see my full review by clicking the tab at the top of the screen. To match the Class 91, Hornby have supplied us with a full rake of coaches for each livery. 
and I'm really pleased to see the colours are now accurate and really have a striking appearance. The coach is accurate, if not lacking in a bit of detail. The seating is basic and it's got one piece bogies, which while good, could have been a bit better detailed. The end of the gangway is fairly basic and it would have been nice to see some red light lenses fitted to the warning lights instead of just a painted representation. In saying that, these coaches have been really well produced. The paint finish and printing is excellent and for £40 a coach, they really are good value in today's market, allowing the modellers to get a correct length of train without needing to remortgage their house. The Mark IV DVT, whilst OK, is the weakest link in the Intercity 225 train sets. It's fairly basic in places and has some glaring inaccuracies, especially on the Swallow liveried one. This has the wrong wiper blades fitted, the wrong horn grill, and some minor livery issues. The DVTs were made at different factories from the Mark IV coaches and the Class 91, and it shows. The level of fit and finish is not as good and the colours don't exactly match the rest of the train, which is really frustrating. I just don't see why they had to produce the DVT in a different place to the coaches. There's also some errors that creep in with the other liveries. The LNER DVT, for example, suffered from shocking quality issues on the cab roofs with dents in the corners and a shiny residue streaked all over the white roof. Improvements are needed before Hornbury released this vehicle again. I finally got my hands on a rake of 10 Cavalex TEA wagons earlier in the year. These are now one of my favourite wagons at Dean Park. They're very well detailed and beautifully presented. They did have an awkward squeaking when I first got them, but a little Woodland Scenics white grease on the axle pinpoints has solved this dreaded squeak and they've now settled down to sterling service at Dean Park. An excellent all-round model. Way back in the spring, I took delivery of my Celebrating Scotland 5 car Azuma pack. This model represents the Class 800 in bi-mode form with both overhead pantograph and the ability to operate a non-electrified track using a series of diesel engines situated under the coaches. My purchase from Scooney Hobbies in Kirkcaldy was purely for the Celebrating Scotland connection. I suppose I'll be able to run it with my LNER Class 91, an HST set, and have a circa 2019 running session. The Hornby model is excellent and it's packed full of details both inside and out. Even the gangway ends are carefully detailed and I really like it. It's got internal lighting both at the cab and the passenger compartments. However, one drawback from this is the terrible light bleed when you run it in the dark, especially around the cab door, which is really bad. The pantograph is also very poor, only allowing a fully up or fully down position. This isn't any use for some modellers who might have lower OHLE. I also think Hornby have fitted the incorrect destination boards on the screens. I don't recall seeing the Zuma regularly operate to Watford and Carlisle. However, on the flip side, this model is beautifully made and finished in the attractive LNER livery. It's a model that's really grown on me. It drives really well and is powered by a really powerful drivetrain. Hornby have done a good job here. It's not perfect, but the positives far outweigh the negatives. I added six of the earlier HAA hoppers from Acura Scale with the strengthening crossbars to my collection in early 2022. These are fantastic models and represent good value for money at £25 per wagon, which considering the level of detail that's packed into them is impressive. The level of detail is brilliant and they run superbly. See my full review by clicking on the banner at the top of the screen.
no real surprise that Backman announced a retool of their Class 37 earlier in the year. They really needed to address some of the issues with their aging model. And address it they well and truly have. I've got a couple of these added to the collection already and I have to admit I really like them. There are numerous but small improvements over the previous version as well as a lot more tech inside. I'm not convinced by their move to the use of a Zemo sound decoder as I much prefer their ESU Lock Sound 5 as used on the Class 47. I've got the deluxe trim versions with uprated glazing and rotating fan. It's good to see Backman have modelled the fan for both earlier and later versions, with the earlier 37 slash zeros having the fan on all the time, with the later versions using a thermostatic fan that cuts in and out. I also added the HST DVT to run with my Mark III and Class 91. The livery shades on this HST are excellent but don't quite match the Mark IV coaches and the Class 91. The model is also a bit of a letdown by poorly fitting lens covers and a semi-transparent white stripe across the full yellow end. Plus it's used the previous tooling without the new kinematic coupler and improved lighting features that we're now seeing on the new releases of the upgraded HST train packs. In third place, we have the Mighty Deltic. I pre-ordered two of the Celebrity Machines, 55022 Royal Scots Grey with its grey roof panels, red buffer beam, silver buffers and white rimmed wheels. Things got even better when I received 55002 in 1980s version of the two-tone green livery. A look I recall seeing as a child at York Museum, and I think this really started my interest in trains. The level of detail in this model is superb, from a wealth of underframe and bogey detail, which includes those troublesome bogey chains, to the lit driver's console and engine room detail that you can see through the side windows. However, I did have some finishing issues on one of my Deltics, and the models are prone to bits detaching themselves whilst in the box or during use. I suppose the sheer amount of detail added to these models has also been its Achilles heel. It's a difficult balancing act between giving modelers even more detail and the model being robust enough to use. I think Acuriscale were, on the whole, successful with this. I passed on my observations at the time, and they've said they'll learn from all the feedback and improve future releases of the Class 55. It's an excellent model, and I look forward to adding a couple more in the future. I've already passed on my wish list to Fran at Acuriscale.
At the start of 2021, I really thought that I'd completed my fleet of Batman Class 47s. I had over 20 of them in a range of liveries and subclasses. However, when Batman announced the updated version in the summer of 2021, I just knew that I'd be adding more to my collection. The deluxe trim caught my attention and throughout the last 18 months has proved a major factor in helping empty my wallet. I've caved in and bought myself just a few. Examples like the Swallow livery, Standard BR Blue with Domino Box and the Kernel Exclusive in Rail Freight Red Stripe were all added to the collection. However, it was a Class 47 Subclass 7 in large logo livery that stole the show for me. At last, Backman had supplied us with 47711 Greyfriars Bobby after a three year wait. Well it is of course the brand new release of the Acura Scale Class 92, a model that really does have that wow factor. I didn't even have any intention of getting one, but now that I have, I think it's just fantastic. The twin operating pantograph will be something that everyone talks about, and while it's been wonderfully done, it's only part of the overall package that makes the 92, or Dyson as it's known by its enthusiasts, such an all-round winner. The crisp detailing and top quality finish elevate it above the company's Deltic. I can only speak from experience, but the model I have is flawlessly presented. It runs well and it sounds superb with its lock sound 5 and twin speaker arrangement. The livery shades are also spot on and all the printing is crisp and sharp. They really have done a fantastic job at Acura Scale. So there you have it, my model of 2022, the Acura Scale 92 in Real Freight Distribution Livery. What would you have chosen as your best model, either from the selection that I've showcased or from your own collection? Please let me know by posting your thoughts in the comment section below. Well that's it for this update and indeed for 2022. I hope you've enjoyed watching the layout progress over the last year and will continue to join me as I tackle the west end of the layout in 2023. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for tuning in to Dean Park and for all your feedback and comments throughout the year. It is without doubt a great hobby to be involved in and for me personally I'm grateful for the chance to be able to share it with you. So until next time, stay safe and all the best for 2023.